mummified bodies used as landmarks on Mount Everest. While Mount Everest offers death at every corner, mountaineers continue to try to scale it. It is unknown how many bodies are on the mountain, but some say there are more than 200. There are several dangers. The higher the climber gets to the summit, the stronger the winds become, which can blow a climber off the mountain, sending them plummeting to their deaths. Lower oxygen levels also make breathing difficult, and a climber may stop for a brief rest only to never wake up again. Frostbite can also occur in minutes. The corpses of the unlucky victims of Everest are well preserved due to the cold climate posed in their last moments in the clothing they set off with on their way to the summit, frozen in time. The rescue of an incapacitated person is so dangerous when high up the mountain that attempting it can result in your own death. So the bodies are often left where the person died. One of the first attempts to reach the summit of Mount Everest was by George Mallory, who was part of a number of British expeditions in the 1920s. In 1924, along with Andrew Irvine, he set off from advanced base camp, never to return. Apart from his ice axe and an oxygen cylinder, Irvine has never been found. Mallory's body was discovered in 1999, his corpse still preserved but sun-bleached, with a taut rope around his waist and a puncture in the front of the skull. It is suggested that the pair fell and the axe struck Mallory in the head. The most famous corpse is Green Boots, thought to be Suwong Paujo, who was an Indian climber who died in 1996. A deadly year in Everest's history, which would see 15 people die trying to reach the summit. He became separated from his party when he sought shelter in an open-mouthed cave. At 8,500 meters, or 27,900 feet, he shivered in the cold until he died in a fetal position, wearing fluorescent green mountaineering boots. Every climber attempting the northeast ridge route to the summit will pass green boots. In 2006, English climber David Sharp would do just this, stopping in the cave to rest. He froze in a sitting down position, unable to move, and appeared to have a severely frostbitten nose, but was still alive. Sharp had opted to climb alone without a Sherpa and without enough oxygen and no radio to call for help. Around 40 climbers passed him by either missing him or assuming he was dead, potentially mistaking him for green boots. Some climbers eventually found Sharp and tried to supply supplementary oxygen. However, because he could not get up to continue, he had to be left to die. Francis Arsentiev and her husband Sergei Arsentiev were part of a climbing group descending back to camp from 8,000 meters high. But they had to do it during the night and on low oxygen supplies, which was incredibly dangerous. At one point she went missing and Sergei chose to turn back to look for her, despite the dangers. On the way, he passed a team of Uzbek climbers. They had found her alive and frostbitten, but she could not move, so they tried to move her down as far as they could, until their own oxygen also depleted to dangerous levels, forcing them to give up their rescue. Francis and Sergei would not make it back to base camp. The next morning, Ian Woodall and Cathy O'Dowd, along with several Uzbeks, discovered Francis still alive pleading for help. However, the difficult location and minus 30 temperature eventually forced them to abandon the rescue, where she would die. Sergei's body was later discovered by the same team who found George Mallory. Today, the preserved mummified bodies on Mount Everest are used as markers by climbers as they aim towards the summit, a grisly reminder of the dangers the mountain poses. Strange Famous Deaths in History History has shown some strange deaths. Let's look at some of the most unfortunate and bizarre famous deaths from the 20th century. Brandon Lee, shot on a movie set. Brandon Lee was making a career in martial arts and in the movie industry like his father Bruce Lee had done. In 1993, at the age of 28, he was starring as the Crow in the movie of the same name. In a scene that was being filmed, actor Michael Massey's character fired a 44 Magnum revolver. For a previous scene, the prop had been fitted with inert dummy cartridges to give a realistic appearance for close-ups of the gun on camera. Unfortunately, the film's prop crew had purchased live rounds and removed the powder to create the dummy rounds, but left the primer in the cartridges. For the new scene, blanks had been placed into the 44 Magnum, but beforehand, one of the dummy rounds had been fired 
and its bullet had become lodged halfway in the barrel. Michael Massey shot at Brandon Lee, and the bullet that was lodged in the barrel left the gun and entered his abdomen. After six hours of surgery, Lee was pronounced dead. Bando Mitsuguro, poisoned by a fish. Acclaimed Japanese kabuki actor, Bando Mitsuguro VIII, had claimed that he was immune from the toxins found in the famous poisonous pufferfish dish known as fugu. It is prepared for the customer only if they know the risks. He ate not one, but four fugu livers, which is one of the most toxic parts of the fish, and died from severe poisoning. Because of his fame, the fugu chef had felt he could not have refused the actor. As a result of the death, he lost his fugu license. Isadora Duncan, killed by a scarf. Isadora Duncan was an American dancer who loved wearing long scarves. One day in 1927, she was traveling in an open-top car in Nice, France. Her long silk scarf became stuck in the rear wheel of the car and tightened around her neck, breaking it and hurling her from the car onto the stone pavement. Harry Houdini, punched in the stomach. Harry Houdini was a famous American escape artist who had cheated death many times in his acts, but this time he would not be so lucky. In 1926, Houdini was backstage after a show when a student who was an amateur boxer asked him if it was true he could take a punch from anyone without getting hurt. Reclining on a couch with a broken ankle, Houdini was exhausted but agreed to let the boxer punch him in the stomach. All of a sudden, the boxer punched him four times in the stomach. A few days later, Houdini was in great pain but performed on stage in Detroit going against his doctor's advice. He finished the show, but passed out afterwards. His appendix had become ruptured from the punches, and he died in the hospital. Strange Deaths in History, the 20th Century History has shown some strange deaths. Let's look at some of the most unfortunate and bizarre deaths from the 20th century. Window Pain, Pain, 1993 Gary Hoy was a 38-year-old lawyer who liked to perform a stunt showing how strong and safe the window panes were by throwing himself against them. He did this demonstration frequently and bounced harmlessly back every time. On July 9, 1993, on the 24th floor of the Toronto Dominion Center, Hoy was proving to a group of law students how unbreakable the glass windows were. He barged into the windows as usual and bounced back then charged at them a second time. The window didn't shatter, but it popped off the frame and Hoy plunged 300 feet to his death. He was described by the legal firm as one of the best and brightest. Death by Cactus, 1982. In 1982, friends David Grunman and James Joseph Suchachi went wandering around Lake Pleasant, Arizona, to do some target practice with their shotguns. They decided to fire at a small cigarro, a type of tall cactus, blasting it into pieces. Needing a bigger challenge, Grunman then targeted a 26-foot tall cigarro, shooting it several times in the trunk. A four-foot arm of the cactus that was weakened by the blast fell on Grunman, crushing him to death. Poison Umbrella 1978. A Bulgarian dissident, Georgi Markov, was assassinated by an umbrella during the Cold War. He had made an enemy of the Bulgarian communist regime, not only by defecting to the West, but also because he criticized the communist government in his writings. In 1978, he was waiting at the bus stop in London where he worked, when he felt a pain in his leg. He said that he noticed a man picking up an umbrella off the ground, who then hurried to a taxi across the road. The umbrella had been a specifically designed weapon that shot a ricin-filled pellet into the leg of Markov, which poisoned him. Markov died a few days later. The assassin was connected to the KGB and the Bulgarian secret police. Parachute Suit, 1912 An Austrian-born tailor named Franz Reichelt invented a parachute suit. He invented it to save aviators' lives if their flying machines were about to crash. His silk parachute coat was activated by extending the arms, which would deploy the parachute, allowing the aviator to glide to safety. Tests with dummies a year before had proven inconclusive. 
In 1912, he finally got permission to demonstrate his invention by jumping off the Eiffel Tower himself. Reichelt went to the first deck of the Eiffel Tower, 187 feet above ground, wearing the parachute suit in front of a giant crowd. He made the jump, and the suit failed, causing him to fall to his death. The Monk That Burned Himself to Death The Vietnam War, 1963 on the morning of June 11, 1963, at a road intersection in Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, several hundred Buddhist monks and nuns had gathered to carry out a peaceful protest. It was at the height of the Buddhist crisis in South Vietnam where there was a statewide protest and unrest against what was seen as religious persecution by the Xiem government, who were seen as favoring the Roman Catholic minority. It was alleged that important government and army positions were only being given to Roman Catholics, and that those of the Buddhist faith were having to convert, sometimes forcibly, in order to progress in public life. On top of that, the Buddhist majority felt the Roman Catholic minority were getting most of the government and foreign aid. It had all come to a head a month before at the Vietnam city of Hue, when the Buddhists were banned from flying their flag in honor of the birth of their prophet, Gautama Buddha. A large crowd of Buddhists who had protested against the ban had been fired on by government forces, who killed nine of the protesters. Later, the government would try to blame the deaths on the Viet Cong. The day before the intersection protest that was due to be held outside the Cambodian embassy, the foreign press had been invited to attend the protest, with the promise that something big was going to happen. On the actual day, few members of the press had attended, as there had been numerous such events that week so there was no reason to think that this one would be any different. One of the few that did attend was Malcolm Brown, a reporter from the news agency, The Associated Press. What he was to witness and photograph would have a profound effect on him and public opinion across the world. On the day of the protest, around 400 Buddhist monks and nuns marched to the intersection, carrying banners and protesting about the government's oppression of their faith and culture. Then a car pulled up and three monks got out, one of them being a devout monk called Thich Quang Duc. Then Duc sat in the middle of the intersection, in the lotus position, on a cushion. One of the other monks who had arrived with him then poured gasoline over him from a five-gallon container. As Duc said a prayer in homage to infinite light, he set fire to himself with a match. The flames engulfed him, and witnesses later testified that he did not once flinch or cry out. The crowd looked on in horror, some in silence while others sobbed or prayed, many falling to their knees, some simply laid on the floor in shock and disbelief. Duk had left a note asking the country's president, Ngo Dinh Diem, politely and passionately for religious equality in Vietnam, especially for Buddhists. It is said that despite the body being charred to ashes, the heart remained intact and unburnt. The reporter, Malcolm Brown, had managed to take a picture of Duke burning, though horrifying, it conveyed Duke's dignity and devotion as he endured what must have been a most painful death. The fallout from the event was profound and far-reaching. President Kennedy, the main backer of South Vietnam at the time, was utterly shocked. Communist China distributed millions of pictures of the burning, claiming it was yet another example of American imperialism and oppressing the people of Asia. The pro-government newspaper, The Times of Vietnam, tried to blame all the unrest on the Buddhist monks and foreign journalists. Diem's government even went as far as to make fanciful claims that Duke had been drugged before being forced to commit suicide. And another claim was that the American journalist that had taken the picture of Duke burning had bribed him to do it. A few months later, President Diem's government was overthrown and Diem himself was assassinated. All this was overshadowed the following year as North Vietnamese gunboats were alleged to have attacked U.S. naval forces in the Gulf of Tonkin off the west coast of Vietnam. This event led to a sharp escalation of hostilities between the United States and North Vietnam, leading to the Vietnam conflict turning into a full, all-out war. What was inside this tunnel that killed 520 passengers? The Italian train mystery. Train 8017, March 3rd, 1944, 050 hours. World War II had been a humiliating and painful experience for the Italian people, 
Their military campaign in North Africa had ended in disaster, with the loss of all their colonies there, and was quickly followed by the Allies invading Italy itself in the summer of 1943. This resulted in the overthrowing of the Italian fascist government, forcing their leader, the dictator Benito Mussolini, to go into exile. By March of 1944, it seemed the German Nazi regime was surely on the verge of collapse, as it was rumored that soon the Allies would be invading northern France. Then it was hoped it would only be a matter of time before the war in Europe would finally be over, and things could start to return to normal in Italy once again. On the rainy night of March 2, 1944, the overnight steam power freight train 8017 from Badapaglia to Potenza did not pass through the railway station at Balvano in southern Italy. The station master there was not overly worried. Despite the war being all but over in Italy, it was still causing major disruption to an already overburdened and damaged state-run railway system. Therefore, the station master simply presumed the freight train had either been delayed or canceled at short notice, a common occurrence at the time. But later, at 5.10 that morning, when one of the crewmen from the freight train staggered into the railway station, the station master knew something was seriously wrong. The man's face was white with shock, and he seemed totally disoriented, muttering something about them all being dead, hundreds of them. What the station master could make out from the man's almost incoherent babbling was that the freight train with its 47 cars was crammed full of illegal passengers, desperate to get to Naples. The train crew had tried to limit the number of passengers who were getting onto the freight wagons, but they had been overwhelmed with the sheer quantity of people forcing themselves on board. This was of no surprise to the station master, for while this was a freight train with no passenger carriages, it was not uncommon for them to be crammed full of people and black market smugglers, as there was a desperate shortage of passenger services throughout Italy at the time. So the train had set off, and though being pulled by two locomotives, it was massively overloaded, and to make matters worse, the locomotives were using low-grade coal. The railway companies were suffering from coal shortages and had to resort to using lower-quality fuel. Therefore, the underpowered and overweight freight train meandered slowly through the Epienne Mountains, not able to pick up speed on the ice-covered tracks. So when it came to the long tunnel at Armi that was on an incline in the middle of nowhere, the train had stalled inside. With a few of its rearmost carriages sticking out the back of the tunnel entrance, there are conflicting reports as to why the train stopped, the two theories being that the train was unable to pull the weight or had to stop due to an oncoming train. Within minutes, all of the people in the tunnel itself were dead. What had killed them? Since it was about 1 a.m. in the morning, most of the passengers were fast asleep, totally unaware that the train was stuck in the tunnel and struggling to get out of it. As the freight trains desperately revved their engines to get more power and free themselves, this produced more and more carbon monoxide. Because the tunnel had no real ventilation, it quickly filled up with the totally odorless and highly poisonous gas, meaning it gradually suffocated the unsuspecting passengers and crew. Researchers later learned that the train had two different locomotives attached, and these trains could not communicate with each other. This was due to the 476 locomotive being Austrian-built and having a right-hand driver. The 480 locomotive was left-handed. This prevented the conductors from the individual locomotives from communicating. It was found that the 480 locomotive tried to restart and move forward, and the 476 locomotive tried to reverse out of the tunnel. A few of the passengers had figured out what was going on and attempted to flee down the tunnel towards its exit, but by now had been too weak to make it. Instead, collapsing to the ground unconscious as the gas slowly suffocated them too. Horrified by what he had heard, the station master grabbed a lamp and hurriedly organized a rescue team, which set off in a locomotive almost immediately. As the tunnel was just a few miles from the station, they arrived at the scene within 15 minutes, only to find the track in the tunnel was littered with dead bodies everywhere. A short time later, it was discovered at the other end of the tunnel, there were a few carriages at the rear of the train that were sticking out of the tunnel. They found a handful of survivors. All of the people in the tunnel itself were dead. It was later discovered that 520 of the train's passengers died from asphyxiation by the carbon monoxide created inside the tunnel. Even 50 of the rescuers had to be treated for carbon monoxide poisoning as they had entered the fume-filled tunnel in a vain attempt to find survivors. In fact, it would be several hours before it was truly safe to enter the tunnel. 
The vast amounts of dead bodies were moved and stacked up on the railway station platform, awaiting identification and burial. In the end, most were buried in mass graves in the local cemetery, without any kind of religious ceremony being carried out due to the lack of resources in wartime. As the war was still very much ongoing, the Allied High Command decided to downplay the tragedy, and it was given very little publicity at the time, because they feared it might damage Italy's fragile morale and overshadow the war effort against the Nazis. Though an official inquiry would be eventually held and would conclude that the tragedy had occurred due to a combination of unfortunate circumstances that had ultimately been brought about by the war, therefore it concluded that no one was truly responsible for what had happened. Nevertheless, the government didn't want people to learn of this accident that was one of the worst rail disasters of the century. They feared that the people and their allies would blame the government for the lack of quality coal and the restricted passenger trains. Four Strange Military Deaths Although death shouldn't be entertaining, throughout history there have been some occasions where the poor soul has been so unlucky or caught in such strange circumstances, it's almost impossible to be anything other than interested. There was the owner of the Segway, who later died falling off a cliff while on one, or famous early 20th century dancer Isadora Duncan, who jumped in her car, got her scarf tangled in the wheels, and was strangled to death the moment the driver took off. And the military is no exception. Not all who die while wearing a uniform do so in battle, or as you might expect. Some unfortunate souls have died in truly strange ways. Number 1. The Siege of Famagusta in more early modern times, military deaths could be ceremonial, unusual, or just plain gruesome. One that still stands out around 500 years later is that of Venetian captain Mark Antonio Bragadin. In 1570, the Ottomans invaded Famagusta in Cyprus as part of their goal to seize control of the Mediterranean. At the time, the island was under the control of the Venetians, and Famagusta was in the hands of strong leadership in Bragadin. However, this wasn't enough as the force of the Ottomans bombarding the city for months on end meant the Venetians found themselves running low on food, ammo, and resources. Despite the citizens begging that they surrender, Bragadin refused until July 31st, 1571, when the city was dying and many of its citizens starving. The next day, he surrendered to Lala Mustafa Pasha, commander of the Ottoman army, who promised safe passage off the island to the Venetians. What happened next is unclear, but whatever did happen, Pasha changed his mind about providing safe passage for the surrendered forces, possibly in anger due to the massive loss of tens of thousands of Ottoman troops in the siege, or possibly in response to six missing Ottoman hostages that Bragadin either killed or simply did not know the whereabouts of, or even just in anger at Bragadin's continued victor's attitude. Accounts differ on this, but they do not on what happens next. In response, Pasha said about executing one of the strangest and most gruesome deaths on Captain Bragadin. Later going down in history for its brutality, Pasha ordered that Bragadin's nose and ears be cut off, and over the coming days, wounds still gaping and open, he was forced to carry earth to fill ditches, kissing the ground every time Pasha crossed his path. After 17 days of torture, according to Crowley, he was then tied to a chair and set above a ship's mast for the masses to stare and jeer before finally being taken and literally skinned alive, one of the most horrific execution methods in history. Finally, his corpse was stuffed with straw, dressed in commander robes, and paraded through the streets of Famagusta atop a cow. It was a strange and brutal death for the revered Venetian captain. Number 2. Nuclear Accident on January 3, 1961, two Army specialists, John A. Burns and Richard Leroy McKinley, alongside Navy electrician Richard C. Legg, found themselves tasked with the responsibility of restarting the SL-1 nuclear reactor in Idaho after it had been shut down for 11 days for routine maintenance. All three military personnel were on active duty and only in their 20s. Both Legg and Burns had received their certification as reactor operators and 
Grant McKinley was due to pass his own the next month before things went tragically wrong. The SL-1 power plant, short for Stationary Low Power Reactor No. 1, was a prototype small mobile reactor at one of America's major atomic testing stations. The idea was that the tech could be developed so the Army could employ it in remote areas. Unfortunately, when Burns, aged 22, went to restart the reactor, it's believed he pulled the control rod 20 inches out of the core, which was tragically too far. The resulting reaction caused a wall of steam, metal, and water to rush towards the three men, killing Burns and Leg instantly, with McKinley dying approximately two hours later. It was the first nuclear reaction on U.S. soil to result in casualties, and not necessarily the way you'd expect to go on duty. Number 3. The Chichijima Incident Long before George H.W. Bush or George Bush Sr. was president, he was a World War II fighter pilot involved in Pacific air raids in Chichijima, a small but well-fortified Japanese island. On the 2nd of September 1944, Bush was tasked with destroying the island's radio towers. It was 8.15 a.m. when the Japanese anti-aircraft guns hid in wait in the forest below, and the squadron of TBM Avengers nosedived over their target. Bush watched as thunderous flak greeted them, with the lead planes burning up into smithereens. Shaking, holding his breath, and taking heavy fire himself, he continued to fly through the dark clouds of what remained of his peers and unloaded his four 500 pounds bombs. Seeing his engine up in smoke, he managed to parachute himself into the middle of the ocean, a few miles northeast of the Chichijima Island. But his crewmates were not as quick and perished, with the Japanese already sailing out to capture him he was rescued by a U.S. submarine that emerged from the ocean to take him on board. He was the lucky one. Over the decades, author James Bradley spoke to and tracked down the family and friends of Bush's naval aviator peers, as well as relatives of the Japanese commanders. Bradley uncovered transcripts of secret war crime trials that showed just how horrifically eight other American POWs of Chichijima had died. American bombers would kill more Japanese civilians than soldiers during World War II, so their fates when captured were merciless. They were beaten and tortured before being killed. But it's what came next that was truly gruesome. As instructed by Lieutenant General Tachibana, the unprovisioned Japanese dissected and skinned alive the now dead airmen and ate their fallen enemies. Not a meal many would want to share. The truth of the cannibalism that occurred during World War II was only uncovered decades later, when the sealed documents finally came to light. Number 4. John Sedgwick Union General John Sedgwick has gained his place in history for two reasons. For being the highest ranking Union casualty of the United States Civil War, and for his awkwardly ironic death on the battlefield. It was a light skirmish that took place on May 9, 1864. In fact, the general was busy bantering with Officer Martin T. McMahon when, as he described, a sprinkle of bullets came down upon them and several officers dodged out of the way. Sedgwick himself, a well-liked general, General laughed and teased his officers that the enemy couldn't hit an elephant at this distance, which really is just asking for trouble. Moments later, another rain of bullets forced a nearby soldier to abruptly dodge to the ground, in essence throwing himself at Sedgwick's feet, who laughed and repeated his comment. According to McMahon, he said, Why, my man, I am ashamed at you, dodging that way. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. What happened next seemed almost comically timed. After the soldier's quick quick reply. The general laughed and said, all right, my man, go to your place. Mere minutes after the second, a third sprinkle of bullets hit the party, and General Sedgwick was tragically struck under his left cheek, dying almost instantly. Just goes to show, you should never tempt fate. Although in the military, a certain amount of death is unfortunately expected, it's very rare that you would encounter the truly strange, ironic, or just plain gruesome ways to go these poor people experience. Let's just hope there are no bullets or elephants on the horizon. The Revenge of the Severed Head 892 AD Back in the 9th century, Britain was fragmented into many small kingdoms and was plagued by regular attacks from Viking raiders originating from Scandinavia. It had become so bad that many of these raiders had established numerous permanent Viking colonies and bases across Britain, 
It was around this time that the legendary King Alfred the Great was battling to unify England in an attempt to drive the Vikings from the English shores once and for all. One of the smallest and most remote of these Viking kingdoms was based in the north of Britain on the small Scottish island group known as the Orkney Islands. This had been given to Rogvald Eistensen, the head of the House of Eistensen, by the Viking king of Norway, Harald Fairhair, as compensation for the death of one of his sons, Ivar, who died in a battle in Scotland in the service of the king. Ivar had died fighting to reclaim the Orkney Islands from renegade pirate Vikings who had fled there to escape the king's justice. Rogvald would pass power to his brother Sigurd Eisensen, second Jarl of Orkney. Sigurd was soon to become known as Sigurd the Mighty. He had earned his title from his heroic exploits. He eventually had a falling out with another local Pictish lord by the name of Male Brigit, the Bucktooth of Moray, named after his apparent overbite. Sigurd decided to take the Lord's castle for himself in order to expand his territory further. When Mael refused to hand over his territory, Sigurd challenged him to a 40-man battle, which was a traditional way to settle differences in those times. On the day of the battle, Sigurd cheated by bringing along 80 men instead of the agreed 40, which allowed him to swiftly defeat Mael, who he beheaded for his collection. While on horseback, Sigurd paraded around the severed head as a trophy for all to see. Sigurd had even ordered all of his men to put severed heads of the men they had slain on their horses for the ride home to show the people how he had won a great victory and killed his enemies. Unfortunately for Sigurd, he was about to suffer one of the strangest deaths in history. As he and his men rode the long journey home, showing off his great victory, Mael's head and his buck tooth had scratched against an open wound on Sigurd's leg. To many, it looked like Mael's famous buck tooth was seemingly biting into the wound in some kind of act of bloody vengeance from beyond the grave. As a result of the scratches from the bloodied and severed head and the bacteria that it carried entering his bloodstream, Sigurd's seemingly minor wound festered became inflamed and infected, creating a foul stench. Before dawn arrived, he was dead. He was buried where he died near a Scottish town called Dornach, in a tumulus, a mound of earth raised over a grave which would become known as Sigurd's How. It is said that after the funeral, Sigurd's servants gathered his collection of severed heads and noticed that Mael had a big bucktooth grin. And, as if cursed, the region quickly fell into chaos as Sigurd's son, Guttorm, died childless just a few months into his reign. Then Sigurd's brother, Rogvald, named his own son Halad as the next Earl of Orkney, but almost immediately the Orkneys started to be plagued by constant renegade Viking attacks. After only a short time, Halad gave up the earldom and fled back to Norway in disgrace, as abandoning his kingdom in such an abrupt manner was seen as a cowardly thing to do. He died a short time later, a broken man. Meanwhile, the Orkney Islands had fallen under the rule of two renegade Viking warlords. But this was short-lived, as Halad's younger brother, Einar, reconquered the islands and eventually established an Eitensen ruling dynasty there that would last for six more centuries. The Weird History of Toilet Deaths Toilets may seem harmless. After all, we use them multiple times a day. But don't be fooled. These disarming devices have caused a surprising number of deaths throughout history. Let's take a look at a few of them today. Taking the Plunge – The Erfurt Latrine Disaster, 1184 in the year 1184, in the German town of Erfurt, there was one particularly infamous toilet disaster. Nobles had traveled from across the Holy Roman Empire in an attempt to negotiate peace between the feuding Louis III of Thuringia and Archbishop Conrad of Mainz. Nobles took their seats in an annex of St. Peter's Church, eagerly waiting for the assembly to begin. But no sooner had the gathering commenced when, all of a sudden, the wooden floor of the annex collapsed, sending the men plummeting into the latrine in the cellar. All in all, it's estimated that 60 people drowned in the excrement below. 
Sponge on a Stick Roman Infections circa 753 BC to 476 AD Romans had a pretty sophisticated sanitation system for their time, but they were not immune to the dangers of toilets. Since toilet paper hadn't been invented yet, they used sponges on a stick to clean themselves up. These sponge sticks were considered communal, however, and were shared between strangers, passing along intestinal parasites with them. If you were wealthy enough to have a toilet in your home in this period, you might have been even worse off in certain circumstances. Toilets usually drained straight down into cesspits, which were often located right next to the kitchen. As a result, this generally enabled bacteria and parasites to travel up into the home where food was prepared. What's worse is that the River Tiber was known to have flooded on occasion, sloshing human waste up into people's homes. Not only did this contribute to rife dysentery and roundworm in Rome, but it stunk a whole lot too. Bathroom Butchery Godfrey the Hunchback, 1069 Not all toilet deaths were accidental though. In 1069, the Counts of Flanders and Holland desired to get rid of their enemy, the Duke of Lower Lorraine, Godfrey the Hunchback. They went about this by hiring an assassin who found a creative way to execute his plan. In the middle of the night, he snuck underneath the latrines that had been built into the side of the castle wall next to Godfrey's bedroom. When Godfrey woke up to relieve himself, the cunning assassin stabbed him up the rear end with a spear. It took a few days for Godfrey to die, but the assassination was a success. Explosive Diarrhea – Toilet Explosions from Ancient to Victorian Times from ancient Rome right through to the Victorian era, it was not uncommon to hear reports of exploding toilets. This proved a particular issue with public latrines, which saw a lot of use before ordinary households gained access to running water. If release valves were not working properly, the buildup of noxious gases could sometimes increase pressure until boom. This generally resulted in serious injuries from cuts and burns on the backside to actual fatalities. With a chance of being launched into the air at your local latrine ever present, maybe it's not so difficult to understand the growth and popularity of the private toilet. Stinking Ships – German Submarine U-1206, 1945 Fast forward to 1945, on board the German submarine U-1206. An engineer had been called in to investigate when the toilet was found to have been acting up. Mistakenly pulling the valves in the wrong order, however, the engineer stood by helplessly as seawater gushed from the toilet into the main hall where it reacted with a battery on the ship. The contact between the two substances generated deadly chlorine gas, forcing the crew to quickly return to the surface to release it. But as they resurfaced, they were spotted by British planes who promptly sunk the German vessel. Many of the crew managed to survive by deploying life rafts to get them to shore, but four crew members died as a result of the malfunction. So, what are your thoughts on toilets now? Suddenly, they don't feel so safe. Let us know in the comments below. The actor who staged a coup and committed seppuku. 1970. Yukio Mishima was the pen name of Hiraoka Kimitake. He's regarded as one of the most important Japanese authors of the 20th century, but met a shocking end when he attempted a coup d'etat. During World War II, Mishima served in a factory having been deemed unfit for military service due to tuberculosis. His first novel, Thieves, which was about two young members of the aristocracy drawn towards suicide, was published in 1948, but it was his novel, Confessions of a Mask, published in 1949, that made him famous and hailed a genius by critics at the age of just 24. Many of his works were translated into English and he grew famous overseas. As well as a novelist, Mishima was a playwright and an actor, writing several plays and starring in films such as Patriotism, 
playing a 1930s army officer who commits seppuku with his wife. Mishima spoke fluent English, but was a strongly patriotic nationalist who hated the American occupation of post-war Japan, the peace constitution, and the end of the emperor's divine status. In 1967, he joined the Japanese army, which was now the ground self-defense force, and its now purely defensive role was something that Mishima was against. In 1968, Mishima founded a nationalist private militia of around 100 people, called the Tetanokai, or Shield Society. It was against the westernization and materialism of Japan and the erosion of old Japanese values. He wanted Japan to return to how it had been in pre-war times, with strong patriotism and traditions such as Bushido, the code of the samurai. One of the core beliefs of this private army that was made up of students was that the emperor had to be protected in case of a leftist or communist uprising. After World War II, Emperor Hirohito had his divine status removed by the occupying U.S. forces, and he had publicly admitted to the Japanese people that he was not a living god. Along this nationalist ideology, Mishima taught his cadets physical discipline and martial arts training. On November 25, 1970, Mishima and four members of the Tatanokai moved into the Self-Defense Forces facility in Ichigaya, Tokyo. Earlier, Mishima had his final book in the Sea of Fertility series sent off for publishing. The group were welcomed into General Mashita's office for a meeting. After talking for a while, the signal was given and the group moved on the general, gagged and tied him to a chair as a hostage and barricaded the room. Several unarmed officers managed to break into the office, overcoming the weak barricade, but Mishima had fended them off and wounded some of them with his 17th century samurai sword he had been carrying. The officers, some bleeding from the attack, backed away out of the room, and Mishima threatened to kill General Mashita if the officers in the base were not summoned to the parade ground to hear him speak. The police that arrived accepted the truce and did not use their weapons, while the soldiers assembled as demanded. Police were also able to use their cameras through a broken window to capture photos of Mishima and his group. Mishima moved to the large balcony with his manifesto and began a speech to the 1,000-strong military staff below. In the speech, he called for a coup d'etat. He wanted an end to the current Japanese peace constitution, effectively bringing back the old ways of the emperor, war, and military aggression. The soldiers were not sympathetic, calling him an idiot. They mocked the speech, referring to how Japan was now at peace. Several minutes later, the speech was over, and Mishima retreated back inside to the office to commit his ritual suicide by seppuku. Mishima plunged a dagger into his abdomen and pulled it across to disembowel himself, shouting, Tenno Heika Banzai. The assigned swordsman, or Kaisha Kunin, Masakatsu Morita, made a mess of the decapitation, striking Mishima's shoulders and back instead of his neck. Another member of the group, kendo swordsman Hiroyasu Koga, took the sword and successfully decapitated Mishima in one chop, causing a disturbing sight to the students as blood spurted from the neck. Morita then took his turn, knelt down and cut along his abdomen as Koga decapitated him. When the police finally broke into the room, the heads of Mishima and Morita were on the carpet and their bodies were covered in coats by the students. Koga and the other students of the group were then arrested. In the aftermath, news of the event spread quickly. Given the shocking actions of such a famous playwright and the act of seppuku, which was unheard of in times of post-war Japan, Misconceptions started to come out of the media. Many readers thought that Mishima was still alive and had finally won the Nobel Peace Prize. What had actually happened was hard for people to comprehend until it was officially confirmed. When it was, a newspaper called Asahi Shumbun even had a photo of his severed head in their article. There is much speculation as to Mishima's motives. He was successful having written over 30 novels, several essays, plays, and films, had been nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize, However, he had always been obsessed with death all his life, and many of his works centered on suicide, in particular by seppuku. It seemed that he planned to commit seppuku in advance, as a statement as an artist and to go out like a samurai, and did not tell most of the followers of the Tatanokai. He likely knew he had no chance once he had taken the general hostage and had made financial preparations to help three of the cadets who came with him, ordering them to stay alive and continue the Tatanokai's ambitions after his death. Robert Liston, the surgeon with a 300% mortality rate, 
Robert Liston was an abrasive man, but an extraordinary surgeon, accomplishing some astonishing records in his lifetime. At just 14 years old, he started his medical education in Edinburgh, and by age 22, he was teaching anatomy there alongside some of the greatest surgeons of his time. Liston didn't just piggyback off the successes of his colleagues. Despite being described as insensitive and argumentative, he gained an impressive reputation as a highly skilled surgeon, earning him the title of the fastest knife in the West End, from medical historian Dr. Richard Gordon. Certainly, speed was one of Liston's special talents. Before each amputation, he would call out, time me, gentlemen, time me, prompting his devoted students to pull out their pocket watches in anticipation of his first move. His fastest time recorded was 25 seconds, a tremendous feat. Speed was particularly important during the early 19th century when Liston was operating, as longer surgeries meant higher mortality rates. Not only were patients operated on without anesthetic, but blood loss could be fatal. On top of this, little was known about germs at the time, so the risk of infection was high. Despite these circumstances, Liston's amputations had a remarkably low mortality rate of just 15%. This compared to another surgeon at the nearby St. Bartholomew's Hospital, whose amputations killed around 25% of patients. Liston's stature also played a part in his reputation. Towering at six feet, two inches tall, he was strong enough to only need one assistant to help hold a patient's leg during an amputation. He sneered at surgeons who used many instruments in their surgeries, preferring to use his own hands to hold flaps and clamp arteries. As unsettling as that may seem now, these are the things that generated such a high demand for his services, particularly in a time of primitive medical technology. Before working at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh in an official capacity, he would operate out of patients' homes, taking on cases that other physicians had given up on. Surgeons traveled across the country to watch his work, and patients even camped outside of his waiting room for days in the hopes of obtaining his services. So how did this man, a world-renowned doctor at the cutting edge of 19th century medicine, come to be the only surgeon with a 300% mortality rate? The statistic is taken from one of his surgeries, which began much like any other day for Liston. At London's University College Hospital, where Liston had been banished after falling out with the more traditional practitioners in Edinburgh, a crowd filled the operating room. As always, there was a sizable audience, spectators eager to watch a leg amputation by the famous Liston. Needing someone to help manage the awake patient, Liston pulled in a student volunteer to hold the leg that was to be amputated. From this moment, things went quickly downhill. Cutting through flesh and bone, Liston carried out his usual technique, completing the amputation in a respectable two minutes and 30 seconds. Unfortunately, in his haste, Liston was unaware that as well as amputating the patient's limb, he was removing two of his student's fingers. Both men were now bleeding profusely and susceptible to infection. Somehow, things managed to get even worse. Wielding his knife with a characteristic flourish, Liston also proceeded to slice through the coattails of a senior surgeon who was standing nearby in order to watch the procedure. Although he didn't physically wound the observer, he did go into a panic state of shock, fearing that he had been stabbed. Within two days, the patient and assistant succumbed to gangrene in the hospital ward. Meanwhile, the traumatized observer was later discovered to have died from shock. Reluctant to admit his mistakes, Liston continued operating as a respected surgeon until he died himself in 1847. Having published a number of path-breaking medical texts, Liston is also credited with revolutionizing surgical medicine through his invention of the bulldog forceps and the so-called Liston splint. Therefore, despite killing triple the number of people he had promised to save that day, Liston left behind a legacy that far overshadows the infamously disastrous surgery, which remains the only single patient operation in history with a 300% mortality rate. The plague that made people dance until they died. Medieval Europe between the 14th and 17th centuries. Europe during the Middle Ages was a time of great hardships. Nearly endless wars led to frequent famines. As the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes famously said, life, particularly for the peasantry, was unusually nasty, brutish, and short. 
One of the peculiar ways in which it appears the peasantry of the Middle Ages dealt with these hardships was through a bizarre phenomenon known as choreomania. The term is derived from the Greek words choros, meaning to dance, and mania, meaning madness or compulsion. Historical records from the 14th to the 17th century documents periods of dancing mania so frequently that they can't be dismissed as mere rumor or exaggeration. Outbreaks of this so-called dancing mania involved groups of people dancing erratically and uncontrollably, sometimes in their hundreds or even thousands. Like a disease, the mania would spread from town to town and even country to country as if it were contagious. Historical records are sometimes very detailed about these outbreaks, which affected men, women, and children, dancing often until they collapsed from exhaustion or injuries. The first sparsely recorded outbreak of dancing mania is actually from the 11th century, where on Christmas Eve in 1021, people are said to have danced en masse in the German town of Kulbeck. A couple hundred years later in Erfurt, another incident was recorded and around the same time in Maastricht, it was said that 200 people fell to their death while dancing on a bridge that collapsed under their weight. However, the first well-documented outbreak of dancing mania was in 1374 in the German town of Aachen. For reasons that are unclear, the people of Aachen started to dance involuntarily. They moved frantically until near the point of total exhaustion. Within weeks, this strange compulsion has spread like the plague to the Netherlands and northeast of France. Hundreds of people uncontrollably jumped, leapt, and twitched for days. Another well-documented outbreak happened 150 years later in France. There was a woman called Frau Trophea who started dancing in the city of Strasbourg in July of 1518 for weeks on end. She was gradually joined by more and more people, and the situation escalated when the city authorities provided a stage and hired musicians in hope of bringing the bizarre crisis to an end. Once the first dancers started their strange ritual, however, others joined in claiming to be overwhelmed by a compulsion. A manuscript in the city's archive of the time offers a glimpse of the scale of the epidemic that followed. It reads, There has been a strange epidemic lately going amongst the folk, so that many in their madness began dancing, which they kept up day and night without interruption until they fell unconscious. Many have died of it. While seemingly improbable, dozens of medieval sources from different towns mention both the 1374 and the 1518 incidents. The latter was even mentioned in the city of Strasbourg's municipal orders, and it is clear from these records that during both incidents, the people afflicted by this dancing mania were not simply shaking from some unknown plague, but actually dancing, albeit involuntarily. They were obviously in great physical and mental pain as well. The records detail that most of those with dancing mania also had horrible hallucinations and could be heard praying for absolution in the middle of their dancing fits. Often they barely ate or slept, and sometimes they were not even fully conscious of their actions. The theories of what actually happened to cause these epidemics varied across the centuries. Some blamed religious beliefs and demonic possession. Others suggested the existence of a dancing cult, while others blamed them on mass poisonings, which caused hallucinations and shaking. One of the most bizarre and yet widespread contemporary explanations was that the dancing mania was brought on by a curse from St. John the Baptist, or in other places, St. Vitus. Why or how either of these dead saints could have made such a curse is unclear, but so common was the belief that in many places the dancing mania was actually named after them, as in St. John's Dance or St. Vitus's Dance. In Italy, the dancing mania was sometimes called tarantism, and it was believed to be brought on by either a spider bite or a dangerous poison. Later on, as medical science evolved, a similar condition to dancing mania was labeled Sydenham chorea, but this disorder was thought to only affect children, causing them to have involuntary tremors in the arms, legs, and face. In 1888, a German gentleman named Justus Friedrich Karl Hecke wrote a fairly comprehensive account of the dancing mania phenomenon entitled The Black Death and the Dancing Mania. In it, he imaginatively describes what he calls St. John's Dance as follows. 
They form circles hand in hand and appearing to have lost all control over their senses continued dancing, regardless of the bystanders, for hours together in wild delirium until at length they fell to the ground in a state of exhaustion. They then complained of extreme oppression and groaned, which they again recovered and remained free from complaint until the next attack. Modern researchers believe the outbreaks were most likely examples of mass psychogenic illness triggered by fear and depression. Both of the most well-documented manias of 1374 and 1518 were preceded by particularly bad periods of devastating famine, crop failures, and disease. Anxiety and fear combined with a religious belief that such hardships were the result of God punishing them for their wrongdoing made people, according to this theory, susceptible to mass delusions that may have gave them some reprieve from their dire situations. Ultimately, this too is just an educated guess. What is for sure, however, is that diagnosing a mass contagion from 500 years ago is not easy. We will probably never know what exactly caused the dancing mania of the Middle Ages, but the urge to dance away one's troubles isn't all that strange if you think about it. <laughs>